That's what it means to have God on your side, is that you understand that just like Romans 8, 28 says, that all things work together for the good of those that seek after God. See, at this point, Saul was no longer doing that, and David was, and that's why David prospered, despite the fact that Saul was plotting against him to kill him. The most, the, the richest, most powerful man in the entire country of Israel seeks his life, and it simply does not happen because it's not what God wanted. That's the kind of protection that God offers. If God is with you, who can be against you? Hey there, fellow tacticians. Don't forget to like and subscribe and ring that little notification bell because the more likes and subscriptions I get, the more people see my conservative content, which will make America a better place and angers the dark cyber overlords at YouTube. In 1775, the Continental Congress created the Chaplain Corps. Under the command of General George Washington, each soldier was required to attend worship service every Sunday. While other armies advanced on their feet, Washington's troops advanced on their knees. It's time for The Chaplain's Report with Caleb Colquitt on tactics. Chaplain's Report today comes from the book of 1 Samuel. We're going to be continuing our series in 1 Samuel. And for those of you who may not know or weren't really following the previous ones may not have seen those. Just suffice it to say that the thing that we've seen most recently is that Saul has started to think of David as an enemy and now is kind of in the phase where he's devising different plots and schemes to try to get rid of David because he's jealous of him and is afraid that David is going to eventually wind up taking his throne, which of course we know with hindsight that he does. But this is the suspicion that Saul has that has caused him to go after David and try to kill him multiple times, despite the fact that David has never done anything except be loyal and do exactly what Saul has asked him to do. But nonetheless, this is the episode we find ourselves in, in 1 Samuel 18, verses 25 through 27. Saul then said, This is what you shall say to David. The king does not desire any dowry, in other words, exchange for his daughter being married to David, does not desire any dowry except a hundred foreskins of the Philistines to take vengeance on the king's enemies. But Saul plotted to have David fall by the hand of the Philistines. When his servants told David these words, it pleased David to become the king's son-in-law. So before the time had expired, David set out and went, and he and his men and fatally struck two hundred men among the Philistines, then David brought their foreskins, and they presented all two hundred of them to the king, so that he might become the king's son-in-law. And Saul gave him his daughter Michal uh, as his wife of Saul. So his, uh, so his name was held in high esteem. So this little episode in David's life is the story of how he wound up being Saul's son-in-law and, and also married his first wife, Michal. But it's one of the stranger stories in the Bible. This is an odd thing to demand of David, and we're not... We see this in a couple of other scenarios in Scripture, but not many. It wasn't enough to just kill the enemies of Saul, he wanted him to, as proof, presumably, bring back their foreskins. You know, th there's a lot of things in the Bible that I think would be a crappy job to have, uh, but I, I gotta believe that David's foreskin collector has gotta be the worst one. <laughs> that you just got done fighting this huge battle, you're tired, you're ready to go, it's like, wait, 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 Saul told us you gotta... <laughs> the Bible's real life, and sometimes real life is funny. Saul told us that we've got to gather up the foreskins of all the Philistines that we slayed and bring them back to him <laughs> as proof that I actually killed all these Philistines. Really, David, how much did he tell you you've got to bring back? Well, he told us 100, but I'm a above and beyond kind of guy, so we're going to bring him double. I need you to cut off 200 of these guys' foreskins. Uh, man. <laughs> so after all that battle, you got to go through the battlefield and, and 
you know, harvest, I, that's the gentlest way I'll say this on what's supposed to be a family show, uh, harvest all of these foreskins and then carry the bag of foreskins back to Saul. Again, this is a weird one, but this is what Saul demanded of David. And David was willing to go through all of this. He was willing to take on Saul's ridiculous task and request because he is his king and this is what he asked in exchange for the hand of his daughter. So, I don't know, I I guess from Michal's perspective, it is kind of impressive that the man who wants to marry you was willing to kill 200 men and then subsequently after going through all the trouble of killing 200 of these men that are the enemies of, of God's people and the enemies of Saul, and it wasn't like they just went out and found random Philistines to kill. This is in the context of a battle and an ongoing conflict that is going on between Israel and the Philistines in a war. But he goes out and does all of this. I got, I mean, ladies, find yourself a guy that would be willing to do something like this for you because David you know, he, he wants to marry Machal, and this is what he's willing to do in exchange for that. Even the the work of killing them and then the work of proving that he killed them through this particular method. Uh, find yourself a guy like that that is willing to go after you and pursue you regardless of what the stakes are and, and what is required of him to do that. I, I guess that if nothing else, as bizarre as this seems to a modern American mind, it does show a great deal of dedication to and desire for his presumptive bride in this case. But also notice, and this is really the bigger message of including the story in the scripture, that this whole plot was devised by Saul that he wants to use this as a method to kill David without having to technically kill him. He's hoping that in this ridiculous way that he is going to get the result of David being dead and he doesn't have to be the one that kills him. They'll have somebody else do his dirty work for him. And he's willing to hurt his own daughters and use them as pawns in this game to do so. And we know for a fact that both of his daughters, both the one that he previously, and we covered this in the last segment, that he previously tried to marry off to David, and also the younger daughter that he is now promised to David and eventually does get married to, that he's willing to use both of them as pawns in his game to get what he wants, which is the destruction of David. But David is so determined in all of this that he doesn't only do what Saul asks, he does double what Saul asked. I mean, this is, again, odd method aside, this is a good son-in-law that offers, because it's what he wants to do, double that which was requested of him to have his daughter's hand in marriage. I think it's pretty clear, honestly, at this point, that David has real feelings for Machal and is willing to go through quite a bit in order to have her marry him. And I think it also goes back to loyalty to and a sense of duty to his king as well. I'm not saying that one or the other is the factor that motivated it exclusively. I think they probably both work in concert in this respect. But either way, this is certainly something that David himself is willing to engage in, whether for Saul's sake or Machal's sake or a combination of both. And wouldn't it have been far more useful to have David as an ally, somebody that is willing to do this, that not only does what you ask him to, but does double what you ask him to? And that's something that's alluded to in this next passage of Scripture that we're going to look at right now, which is the same chapter, verses 28 through 30. When Saul saw and realized that the Lord was with David, and that Machal, Saul's daughter, loved him, then Saul was even more afraid of David, so Saul was David's enemy continually. Then the commanders of the Philistines went to battle, and it happened as often as they went out that David was more successful than all the servants of Saul, 
so his name was held in high esteem. When you're looking at this passage, I think one of the things that it kind of puts on display is that Saul's little scheme here to kill David backfires pretty hard on him. That not only is David not dead, which was the purpose of going through this whole exercise and the purpose of Saul trying to trick David into doing his dirty work for him, but also that in doing that, because he is trying to subvert God's will by killing an innocent man, that it winds up backfiring and Saul, or sorry, David becomes famous and his exploits on the battlefield have become well known and people are genuinely grateful to David for what he's done and lauding praises on him. When you're doing God's work and you are in God's fold, then nothing that you do, no, no plot that any human being has against you is going to ultimately wind up succeeding. It reminds me actually uh, of a verse where it says that no sword that is fashioned against me shall prosper if I am the Lord's. Well, David experienced that firsthand. He saw it. He understood it. Because it had happened to him that when there were evil people like King Saul that wanted his life, that wanted to kill him, and they came up with all these elaborate schemes and plans, all it did was actually make things better for David and worse for Saul. That's what it means to have God on your side, is that you understand that just like Romans 8, 28 says that all things work together for the good of those that seek after God. See, at this point, Saul was no longer doing that, and David was, and that's why David prospered, despite the fact that Saul was plotting against him to kill him. The, most, the, the richest, most powerful man in the entire country of Israel seeks his life, and it simply does not happen because it's not what God wanted. That's the kind of protection that God offers. If God is with you, who can be against you at this point? But I, I want to take us through a quick thought exercise before we close out tonight. We tend to look at stories like this, and we tend to put ourselves in the mindset and in the shoes of David. And that's acceptable. That's what I do. I mean, David's the hero of the story, and he's a very relatable character. And because of that, we tend to think of this story through the lens of, well, what if I were David? And that's not a bad thing at all. But let's take a step back for a second and instead put ourselves in Saul's shoes. Wouldn't it have been so much better for Saul to just have had David as an ally? Somebody like this that is obedient and dutiful and is willing to go so far above and beyond. Having that guy as a son-in-law and a general in your army and somebody that helps you out, even if it's just for selfish reasons, even if it ignores the fact that Saul, at this point, was really acting more in his own interest as opposed to what he thought God wanted him to do. Even from just a personal interest standpoint, that Saul would have been a lot better off if he had just not cared whether or not David was getting adulation and praise from the people. And he would have gotten a lot of adulation and praise himself for just letting David prosper. That's the thing that's so ironic in all of this, is that Saul could have had the kind of son-in-law and the kind of soldier that most people just don't have, that most generals and military commanders would dream of. And instead, he makes him into his greatest enemy. For no reason other than the fact that he's just jealous of all the praise that David is getting. I think that that's a very sobering reminder for us to not be jealous of the success of another person. To not compare yourselves to other people and to remember that doing so really only hurts us. It doesn't hurt them. It doesn't hurt their family. It doesn't hurt God. It hurts us. It is a self-destructive practice. Now, did David have a great deal of turmoil and problems from this? Yeah, that's fair to say. And it's even fair to say that it destroyed Saul's family. So I'd, in my last statement, I don't mean to say that it doesn't hurt anyone else. I guess the, best, the better way to suggest, the, the, the better way to say that is it hurts you the most. Because I do think it's clear 
then the person that was most hurt by Saul's envy was Saul. I mean, sure, it hurt Jonathan, but Jonathan's still a pretty good person that has favor in God's eyes when he dies. It certainly hurt his daughters, but his daughters were in pretty good positions when Saul dies. It hurt David, but David becomes king after all of that. The person that it hurt by far the most was Saul himself. And so when we put ourselves into Saul's shoes, I, th I think the best message to take away from that is don't be your own worst enemy. Don't do things that are going to hurt you more than it hurts everybody else. That's why you go with God's plan and have him on your side and go after and seek to be on his side as opposed to currying him over to your side or doing your own thing. That doesn't work. Do what God wants you to do and you will prosper, just like David did. And I think it also suggests to us that people should be viewed as blessings and not obstacles. Are there people that are obstacles in our life? Yeah, that happens. There were plenty of people in the lives of righteous people, David included, that became obstacles. But if our first inclination is to think of them as blessings, if Saul had thought of David as a blessing in his life to have this very gifted, very talented young man that loves the Lord and wants to do what's best for him, i got to believe that even if Saul does eventually lose his throne to him, which of course he does, that even then, even still, Saul's life would have been a whole lot better towards the tail end of it. And so, let's always let our first inclination and the first way that we try to look at something, when we look at another one of God's fellow children, let's try to look at them as a blessing first, and an obstacle only when that's the only remaining option. When you assume the best in people, that's doing what Christ tended to do. That even when there were all these other factors surrounding them, like the person was a, a publican, a tax collector, or a prostitute, or all these other things, a sinful person, that Jesus always wanted to see the good in people and see the good that they could do rather than the terrible things and the labels that other people slapped on them. Didn't mean he ignored it. Didn't mean he didn't address it. Because very often he did. But it wasn't the first thing that he saw. The first thing that he saw was a child of God that needed God's grace. That's how we should look at people, too. Stay the course, friends. Ever wonder where Superman gets his incredible powers? Some people say it's the yellow sun of Earth, but I think it's because he subscribes to this channel and likes my videos. Now, I'm not saying that if you subscribe to my channel, you'll necessarily wake up tomorrow as a super strong, nearly invincible alien, but it definitely doesn't hurt your chances.